Good morning, welcome for children's time. I'm so glad that you're gonna be joining us. This morning, you're gonna to need to get your Bible. You're gonna to need to get a piece of paper and something to draw with. So I will see you guys soon. The peace of Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome from my home to yours as we worship this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Come, let us bring to God our joys, our concerns, our faith and our doubt as we greet the one who welcomes us in our prayers. Please pray with me. We come singing for joy this morning, Creator God. As with the warming of the days and the coming of the rains, we awaken to bird song through opened windows and spring breezes that stir the stillness of the air. Eyes open to the morning, we see the trees newly covered in greenness, blossoms emerging. How great thou art, O Lord and God, we sing. For just as you pour out your gifts that nourish the earth, so too you have poured out your goodness upon us. Loving kindness, mercy, forgiveness, these have been your gifts. Spirit of joy and wonder, as you stir our souls to life, new possibilities begin to arise before us for our living and our loving. We begin to look at the world with hope. We begin to ask, what is to prevent us from living by your grace? What is to prevent us from sharing the love and mercy we know in you with all who we meet, and indeed with the world you call us to tend? What is to prevent us, God, we ask? Nothing we know is the true answer, and yet we hold back. There are broken relationships among us and among those we're close to. We know there are feelings we are sometimes ashamed to admit. Ideas of reality that we don't want to face. Assumptions that hold us back. What is to prevent us, God, we ask, from sharing your grace in this world? Nothing we know is the true answer, and so we come to you holding out our broken things to you, asking that you would heal us, make us whole, stitch us once more into the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Pour out your spirit upon us once more. Renew your life in us in the name of Jesus, who even now comes among us, teaching us to pray to you together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. What is to prevent us from sharing the love we know in Christ with others? Nothing. Nothing, my friends, for this is a new day, and in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Rise up. In his mercy, we are forgiven, made new, healed and restored. Rise up and go forth this day in the power of the Spirit, giving thanks to God. Amen.
Psalm 22, verses 25 to 31. From you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows I will pay before those who fear you. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Who those who seek him shall praise the Lord and may your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All who sleep in the earth shall bow down to the Lord. All who go down to the dust shall bow down before the Lord. And I shall live for God. Prosperity will serve him future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn seeing that God has done it. Amen. Good morning. Does anybody else's hair go wild when it is raining outside? Mine does, so just ignore that. But I'm so glad you're joining us this week for Children's Time. This week, I wanna be talking to you guys about the words to remember for May. So um, you can find this on our website and uh, it's something that we do with our Sunday school every single month. So we pick some words in the Bible that we want you to remember and um, Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. The one this month is quite easy to remember and I would encourage you to try to memorize it from home. Um, it is Psalm 23 verse one. So you guys can open your Bible to Psalm 23 verse one. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so um, this verse invites us to think about what it means. I shall not want. I know that right now all I want is for the pandemic to be over. I want to be able for things to go back to normal. I want um, to be able to see my family and see my friends. And I focus on that a lot more than I focus on the things that God has given me right now. So I'm in a home, I have food on the table, I have a job, um, my family's safe, my family's healthy, and there are so many things that the Lord has given me, but it's so easy to focus on the things that we want. Um, and so I'm gonna read that verse again, Psalm 23 verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So I know a lot of you guys who are doing online learning from home, I know that you probably miss your friends. It's hard not seeing people in person, but God invites us to trust him and to lean completely on him and know that he will provide for us. And so um, when Karen and I, Reverend Karen and I were thinking about what we wanted the image to be with the words to remember for this month, we thought that a long, long table would be a great image. This idea of a 
long table and I don't know if you've ever seen one of those tables that it just seems to stretch on forever. It seems like you can't even see the end of it. And everyone's able to sit at the table. There's room for everyone and it's laden with food. There's so much food on the table, all of your favorite foods. And that's what God says he will give us. He will invite us to all have a place at the table and to have all of these blessings. Um, and so I want to read to you guys a poem. And um, if you want to while I'm reading it, you could draw an image of a table and you can think about who would I have at this table with me? Would I invite everyone? Would I invite certain people? Who would you invite to the table? And what would your table look like? So our poem today is written by Jan Richardson and it is called, And the Table Will Be Wide. And so if you're not coloring, um, you can close your eyes down as we say this poem um, and just listen to the words. And the table will be wide and the welcome will be wide and the arms will open wide to gather us in and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough. And we will come unhindered and free. And our aching will be met with bread. And our sorrow will be met with wine. And we will open our hands to the feast without shame. And we will turn towards each other without fear. And we will give up our appetite for despair. And we will taste and know of delight and we will become bread for a hungering world and we will become drink for those who thirst and the blessed will become the blessing and everywhere will be the feast. So that poem is pretty special. Um, you can think about it. Think about this invitation God gives us, every one of us, to be invited to the table table that is full of blessings and so think about your blessings this week think about all the things that God has placed on your table and I hope that um, you are doing well and staying safe um, and know that we love you and we miss you and we pray for your families so let's bow our heads and let's pray together now dear God we thank you for a long table we thank you that you are our shepherd and we will not want. We thank you, God, that we can find such comfort in the stories of the lives of people in the Bible. We thank you, God, that you have blessed us so much. We pray that we would remember those blessings. Keep us safe and um, bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, as water in the wilderness brings life, be living water to us now, that as we read, we might know Jesus and receive life in his name. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 8, reading through from verses 8, sorry, 26 to 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to the chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian replied, How can I? 
unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer, so he does not open its mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The Ethiopian asked Philip, about who, may I ask, does the prophet Isaiah say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, what is to stop me from being baptized? Or what is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So begins our scripture reading today with another journey. Journeys are a prominent part of the biblical narrative, and these days I rarely come across them without remembering the many conversations I used to have with David Brearley, who dreamed of creating a Bible study focused on all the different journeys people take in the Bible journeys. They matter tremendously in the scriptural narrative. They, they shape the formation of the people of God, and in our own life, they're pretty important too. When I take a journey, though, I have to confess, these days I rarely, rarely start without consulting Google Maps and making sure my phone is with me for the journey. I have a well-packed suitcase, and I try to think ahead of everything I'm going to need. I definitely have a destination in sight, usually a hotel reservation, and even a good idea of where I'm going to find food along the way. I start out on journeys prepared like this and ready to go, itinerary in hand, everything mapped out. Nothing is going to surprise me. But then I open the scriptures, and I'm confronted with the reality that when God calls us, to go on a journey, it's not like this at all. Go on this road, the Spirit says to Philip. This is nothing new. It's like the journey of Abraham, the journey of the Israelites, the journey of so many before. Go and I'll go with you, says God, and there's not much else offered. Because first and foremost, journeys in the Bible, are about a new beginning in our life with God. And a new beginning quite often in the way we relate to God's world as well. And it's not about what we pack up and take with us and the plans we make as much as being open to being caught up in the plans God has. And sometimes, very often, journeys in the Bible aren't so much about what we pack as about what we leave behind. For those who begin journeys in the scriptures, very often they're called to leave behind familiar people, cultures, family, friends. One of the first journeys described in the scriptures is Abraham. Go, says God, leave your father's house, the land you know, leave, leave all this and, and, and go where I show you. Similar with Philip. Leave this and go. And as so much is left behind, it's good to remember that in the world in which they live, those things they're leaving behind, family, culture, place, they're the things that define their very selves, who they are, how they understand who they are in the world, where you're from, who your family is. It's how you introduce yourself to other people. Oh, 
to leave that behind is to walk into a new understanding of who God is calling you to be. Make no mistake. Philip, who is called to set out on the Gaza road, has experienced this before. He is one of the early deacons of the the church when it was first uh, formed in, at Pentecost in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had told them that well, Jesus had told his disciples before he ascended to heaven that when the Spirit came, they would, in its power, be called to witness to who Jesus was and the way they live and the things they say, and that they were going to be doing that in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It had started in Jerusalem. Philip had been caught up in the life and work of this community that was growing daily and in the way they were living with each other and living in the world, proclaiming the, the presence of, of Christ in their midst, something new happening. Philip was one of the first deacons of the church. He and his colleague Stephen are commissioned for that ministry, which is one of helping people in chapter 6 of the book of Acts. Imagine what that was like for Philip, caught up in a new community. His understanding of who he was was beginning to change, but then, then persecution set in. The early church experienced resistance within the city of Jerusalem. Stephen, his colleague, was stoned. And that, that catapulted an even greater persecution, and, and the followers of Jesus fled. If Stephen was the first recorded martyr of the church, Philip became its first recorded missionary. It's, it's Philip who we hear about as the disciples leave Jerusalem and go out into the world. And, and Philip finds himself in Samaria. Who would have thought? Among a people who are traditionally defined as, as enemy, Philip finds himself baptizing, preaching, doing signs and wonders. How he understands himself must have already been beginning to change. And now the Spirit prompts him again onto a new road towards Gaza and the wilderness where it's hot so hot in the midday as he travels that and I wonder if he could feel the heat of the sand through his sandals. So dry that I hope he had some water with him for the journey. When we set out on journeys in the scripture, we're called to, uh, very often, to leave behind the ways, the cultures, the assumptions that define how we see the world, as well as those things that define how we see ourselves in the world. Philip sets out on the road to Gaza. He's already experienced much in the world, and now something new is going to happen. For there, in the midst of this wilderness road, is a man who we only remember by the label that's given to him, the Ethiopian eunuch. Talk about assumptions. Maybe that's why we're called to remember him that way. It raises up for us an awareness of the way we often look at people. The ancient Greeks and others in that time when Philip lived spoke of Ethiopia as being a place almost exotic at the ends of the earth, full of beautiful and impressive people, they said. And certainly one who dwelled in the presence of the, the queen must have been powerful. Owning a scroll, he must have been rich. But as a eunuch, well, on one hand, it would have elevated him to a, a place of privilege as without progeny of his own, he could be trusted not to be involved in all that palace politicking where people try to um, advance the interests of their own progeny against others. So there's a kind of trust embedded in them. But then from the, the scriptures of the Israelites, well, eunuchs weren't part of the full body of the people. They would have been looked at 
almost as a, as a dis, with some sense of being despised as well. There's a lot there, assumptions, ways of looking at people. And, and maybe he's remembered this way for us to open our eyes to the way we look at people as well. Certainly opens up the many cultural stereotypes and assumptions that guide our relationships with others in the world. But there he is. Philip's been sent out on the road and there he is. And the spirit says, go, go up to the chariot. <laughs> and, and as he goes, he hears this man reading from the prophet Isaiah. He's been in the temple. He's been worshiping, curious about the God of Israel. He would have been welcome into some parts of the temple than not others. And as Philip draws near, he says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I? The Ethiopian says, if there's no one to guide me. He invites Philip into the carriage or the chariot and Philip accepts the invitation. It's an odd image in, in anyone's mind, these two very different men coming together like this. And Philip begins to talk to the Ethiopian about the passage he's been reading. It's a passage about an in, innocent sufferer in a community. It's a passage that comes from the time when the prophet Isaiah was offering hope to people living in exile, to people cut off from their homeland and, and in many ways feeling cut off from the love of their God as well. The message of Isaiah in that particular passage is one of hope to people who felt outcast and marginalized, people who were sick and lame. The part the Ethiopian quotes in our scripture today speaks of the suffering service who, servant who will come and take on the suffering of the people on himself. What a promise that is. The early church is beginning to understand it as speaking of the, of the, of the fullness of, of who Christ was when he came. But the promise of that, amazing. Of whom does the prophet speak? The Ethiopian asks. Himself or someone else? And as he wonders about the hope and the, the good news in this passage, you can almost hear it. The question underneath it all, is this for me? Can I be part of this? It's what we all want to know, isn't it? When, when hope and promises are made, especially the promises of God, they, they sound so good. They sound so close to the longing of our heart, what we want to be swept up in. But who are they for? Is this passage written for an age old people in a time gone by? Are they written for another people who the Lord favors? Can I be one of them? Is this passage for me? wrapped up in, in this kind of questioning are all our own experiences of, of the way the world and we ourselves speak of ourselves. Our own doubts about acceptance, our place in the world, whether we're insiders or outsiders to the good news the Bible proclaims. Of whom does the prophet speak? The Ethiopian asks, could this be for me? He wonders. Imagine, if you will, the conversation, the vulnerability between these two men, one powerful and foreign in a chariot, one on foot, the sharing of knowledge, the good news of Jesus bringing together two men who would, well, in the power of the spirit, who would otherwise not have come across each other, but who have a blessing to offer one to the other in this moment. Imagine, if you will, how this story was received by those Philip would have shared it with. In the early church, as it's beginning to go out into the world, called to share the, the good news of Jesus, his life, his death, God at work in the world for life and hope. And, 
And yet looking around at the places they're called to go and wondering, can I sit and share a meal with a Gentile? Can I come close to being someone who I've been taught is so different, I need to keep my distance? What is to prevent me from doing that? New possibilities of sharing God's blessing are opening up in the church, even as they are among us all the time today. And, and the questions of the old ways, can I do this? Is it permitted? Am I able? Rise up. People look at the story Philip has to share with them, a description of the conversation he has, and wow, it's quite a passage. It helps us to see, I think, why the early church was called the way. That's what they call themselves in the early chapters of the book of Acts. Not because they had figured out a way and gotten it all right, but because they had come to see themselves as being on a journey, moving into the promises of God and guided by the Spirit to be on the way. It means we're not done yet. We're not there yet. Sometimes we find our calling in the blessing we discover in the journey. Two men in the chariots, that's what the pictures show. But the third figure in this story is the Spirit of God, the one who guides the way, who organizes the encounters, who fosters understanding. Contemporary Christian author and theologian Brian McLaren says that the work of the church in the current world is often more about having conversation than focusing on conversion itself. These kind of conversations, the kind that Philip and the Ethiopian have that open us up, that make room for the spirit, for one another, for wonder, for questions, for the expansion of our horizons as we come together under the wideness of God's mercy and God's plans for salvation, the possibilities that open up in those moments when the journey catches us like this. Last fall, I participated in a workshop called Rainbow Pathways to Inclusion that is put on by the Presbyterian Church in Canada. It kept coming back to me this week as I thought about the conversation between Philip and the Ethiopian. This particular workshop took place over two Saturdays. It was led by people who identify as members of the LGBTQ, LGBTQ2SI plus community. And in their sharing of their lives, the stories of others, the expansion of my own knowledge, it felt like the kind of journey that the Bible calls us to go on. The kind of journey that draws us more and more into God's inclusive embrace. The sharing of lives and vulnerability. In the Ethiopian's question, how can I understand if no one explains to me resonates so fully as I remember that workshop and, and how my own understanding changed and my own way of seeing the world expanded listening to what I learned. There's a lot to be learned from listening to other people. And there's stories coming to see more fully and experience the, or to, and to, to realize the experience of risk and rejection they face in the world today. The, the assumptions they wonder they're about, well, they wonder about what, what are the assumptions they're walking into when they enter a new community? How, new ways of seeing. How can I understand if no one explains to me the 
Ethiopian asks. And I remember the story of the family with two moms who are asked only too often, which one of you is the real mom? They're both real moms. <laughs> the experience of a transgendered young person wondering what bathroom to use in their new high school or at youth group when there are only male and female alternatives <laughs> labeled on the doors. who look around wondering where it is they'll find someone safe to talk to about their own experiences as other teenagers are talking about crushes and love and, and clothing and fashion. An older gay couple, two men married for some years now, but, but as they age, facing decisions about moving to retirement homes, new communities, and will they be welcome and accepted there? Things I've only ever taken for granted in my own life. These stories, they open my eyes. They expand my understanding. How can I understand if no one explains to me? How can I understand if I'm not open to the spirit that introduces me to the conversation? I learned so much on that course about people's stories, about the language I use, about the experience of people who are transgendered and gay and lesbian and queer and bisexual in all ages in the, in the world in which I live and move. As we're swept up in God's embrace with Philip and the Ethiopian, I'm beginning to see more clearly that if we do not listen to the prompting of the Spirit that draws us into these conversations, then how will we ever understand? And if we don't deliberately work to do this, then we will intentionally find our, or not, find ourselves excluding. How can I understand, was the one question the Ethiopian asked as they spoke, and in their shared mutuality and vulnerability, they found themselves coming across water, so rare in the wilderness. A gift from God. And the Ethiopian asks now, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Now before the journey, Perhaps the answer would have been everything. There would have certainly been some kind of answer. But now the answer is nothing. There's nothing to prevent him from being baptized. And together they go down into the water and they come up rejoicing. Stop a moment and consider. Is this not the joy that comes with Easter? New possibilities of life lifted up in the Spirit of God? In baptism, we are claimed by the love of God. And in Jesus Christ, we find ourselves belonging to each other through the one who took on our suffering and redeemed us all. The very one the Ethiopian was reading about and wondering who that story was for. It's for all of us. In our baptism, we belong to each other. It's not a fact as much as it's a calling. And the reason for our rejoicing when we too are swept up in the power of the Spirit. Philip <laughs> found himself snatched. I sometimes wonder what that felt like. Though at other times I think I know it's, it's that moment when you go from one way in the world to the other. He found himself in Azotus. The Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing, and we are left in wonder. What happened to them as their journey continued? I don't know. But this I can tell you, and this I believe, that in the power of the Spirit, the blessing of God would continue with them as it does with us. Thanks be to God.
As we come to our time of prayer, I have several announcements for you this morning. One has to do with Vacation Bible School. The organizing team is up and running, looking forward to the week of August 16th. And registration is now open on the website if you want to look that up. The website is my other announcement. Lots goes on at St. Andrews. Um, there are groups that gather for Bible study, for coffee hour. You can find all of that on the website, www.standrewsottawa.ca. There is information about upcoming services, um, my weekly email, all those things are there. Recently, the Christian Communications team put out a, a survey asking you to respond with your own experience of the website, what you look for in it, um, how easily you find it. And I think the deadline to submit that was yesterday, but I think they might still, if you, if you have not yet done that, please do. Let's pray. We come praying this morning, lifting up to you, O oh God, the news we have heard, the things we have seen, the journeys we have been on, and our questions about the places you call us to go. We give you thanks, loving creator, for the gift of this world and the life it offers. We pray for its work and the actions of and the actions of the Holy Spirit in this world that you put us in. As we pray for creation and the many in this world whose hearts are full of grief and longing, we pray that this same power through which you resurrected Jesus would be at work to restore life and goodness to all the corners of this world. Spirit of wisdom, we pray for all those who in their own circumstances find themselves caught in the middle dangling between your ways and theirs. And we pray for those as well who are caught up in the middle of wars and find themselves caught in the midst of family conflict. We pray for them and their struggle and ask, O oh God, for the guidance of your light. Bringer of peace, we pray for the nations of the world and especially their leaders, that they may see and understand and honor the sovereignty of peace and compassion and over and above their own self-interest. You who are parent of us all, we pray for mothers and fathers around the world, for the hopes they have for their children, for the means they need to give them life. We pray for those who are ill and abused and all who need protection and care. Great physician, we pray for those who are sick and those who are holding vigil with them for those who tend the ill and those who are waiting words of hope. We pray for all who are in need of comfort and peace, and especially those who mourn and prepare to lay their beloved to rest this week. We remember before you, O oh God, as we give you thanks for your kingdom, all those who wonder about their own place in the world. We ask, O oh God, that your loving kindness would surround them and bless them that into your, their paths you would come in the power of your spirit with embrace and love. In silence, we bring to you the names close to our own hearts that this day brings forth. As we add up our prayers and entrust them to you, we add to them our prayers for our own selves, our healing, our hope, our courage, our strength. Encourage us with your grace, instill in us your hope, and assure us of your presence and love as we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Let me leave you this week with these words from Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet through which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Go now, my friends, this week in the name of Jesus, the love and compassion of God, and the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.